Hi, we're at Croy 2019 in beautiful Seattle. My name is Jim Pickett. I work with AIDS Foundation of Chicago, and I lead the International Rectal Microbicide Advocates. And I'm really excited to be talking to a rectal rock star, Supreme, <laughs> um, excellent researcher named Craig uh, Hendricks from Johns Hopkins. And we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, HIV prevention research pipeline and where rectal microbicides fit in. So you want to give a little background on yourself, Craig, to get things started? Sure, sure. Yeah. So I'm, a, I'm trained as a clinical pharmacologist and an infectious disease doc. Uh, I did that training all at Hopkins and uh, was on actually in the military for a while after that. And um, I've been doing mostly HIV prevention pharmacology since then, probably for almost 20 years, I guess now. And uh, have been involved, importantly for this discussion, with the Microbicide Trial Network, which has been uh, very active in uh, developing uh, rectal microbicides, uh, certainly alongside vaginal microbicides, and have been involved with a lot of uh, much smaller program project grants that the NIH funds. These are all NIH funded things, which does much earlier preclinical and early clinical stage development for a range of rectal microbicide uh, candidates, different possibilities. And um, and, you know, Croy is Croy. <laughs> so. Croy is Croy. And here we are. And there's a lot going on uh, in the background. Uh, so we know that um, the prevention networks are being recompeted. All the clinical trial networks are being recompeted. And that the microbicide trials network will no longer be at the end of 2020. Yeah. So, you know, and we're hoping that microbicide research will be included in the new HIV prevention trials network, the new PTN. Um, but there definitely has seemed to be uh, some, you know, there's not a lot of excitement about the products we're thinking about microbicides. There's more of a push towards long-acting systemic products. Mm -hmm. But I think you and I both agree that we need to have a variety of, project, of products. Like long-acting and systemic are great, but some people will want something that's short-acting, user-controlled, stays where you put it, is not systemic. So I just wanted to you know, get your thoughts on sort of the field in general, and then since you have such expertise in rectal microbicides, among other things, but we're going to sure, focus sure. on the booty today, yeah. okay. um, where you kind of fit in there, and what you're seeing for the future of rectal yeah. microbicides, what you have cooking. Sure. So I think there, there is a lot of excitement, and, and, um, and at this meeting, for sure, there's a lot of stuff on long-acting, uh, long-acting injectables, long-acting implantables, and some very high-tech stuff. And it's technologically very complicated. But it's a it's it's one strategy. Uh, it's sort of you know what we have right now that's licensed is one pill once a day with tenofovir trisidabine oral daily prep. There's shorter on demand regimens, um, and the advantage of the on demand regimens is it actually sort of fits better into lifestyle. It's even that difference of once a day dosing at least for men that have sex with men and transgender women um, to do on demand. Uh, provides some flexibility and it minimizes mm -hmm. the systemic exposures the you know having drug levels in your body all the time that have what statistically are quite low levels of toxicity but it's just the personal decision that many people make that they don't want the drugs there all the time or they don't need them all the time the other part right. to, again to distinguish it from long acting is that in addition to on demand and oral prep is on demand the long acting's um, almost to a one are not going to be on demand. Right, they have to be delivered in the clinic. They have to be delivered in the in, clinic. Yeah. They have, some of them have, uh, at least the way they're being developed now, they have kind of a high healthcare system burden to some degree, but that's going to get smaller. That's because those are, those are logistical, institutional, organizational problems that will get better. But, sure, but as sure. they're being developed now, they're, uh, there's a big burden. Now the other strategy would be to not have long acting but have only acting when you need it, which is why I mentioned the on-demand, the Ipergay, and then the follow-on study, very, very positive results. So in terms of microbicides, particularly rectal microbicides, the, I the idea would be is there a way to, to deal just at the time you need it? And even more than that, is there a way that you could apply uh, the prevention uh, formulation, the drug, whatever, whatever, whether it's a liquid or a gel or a douche or whatever, could you do it just when you need it and even do it as part of the usual preparation for sex or just part of sex itself? Right, right. And, and that's where some of these ideas about formulations with a, a rectal microbicide as a douche, because uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of data out there that a lot of men that, are, that are, have receptive anal sex 
routinely douche before uh, they have sex. Right, to feel fresh and clean clean and and ready to go. Ready to go. And and the thing is, why don't we just sort of piggyback, maybe it's not a great uh, word for that. Actually, but it does work. Does it work? Yes, so, definitely. All right. So we, you know, we're like going to piggyback. <laughs> we're, you know, we take whatever, whatever the douche is that they, that it, however they might normally douche, we medicate that. Uh, so that's a little bit different, but at least the douching behavior is the same behavior. We don't have so to convince people to douche. We're not. They're, they're already it. doing it. We're just going to yeah. make it a an enhanced product, right. and enhanced in the sense of of um, I could say protection, but it's better to say, um, you know, freedom, reassurance. Mm-hmm. to put it in a positive light to keep the fun part of sex there so that it's just so it's not a drag that you you know you got to you know you know whatever get your infusion or your injection or something and but sex can't always be about risk mitigation right, right. I mean, you're not, always I mean, conflating risk and sex and it just makes sex it just a takes real the, drag. it takes the fun out of it you, yeah. you know when you talk and even like words like harm reduction which are, which is a very important strategy in its setting but you, but you say the word harm you say the word so we're, right. so anyway so so the whole idea of these behaviorally congruent strategies is it minimizes not a hundred percent but to a great extent um, the need for behavior change so that it fits into existing patterns and takes advantage of those. All right, so how so how would that work? And some of yeah. them are behaviorally congruent that are in development. Some of them. Um, are close or are sort of small. So let me talk about a couple of these. So the two that I mentioned that are uh, that are in development would be a rectal douche. Uh, there's a rectal. There's there are several rectal douches in development. There's one with tenofovir that, that we're actually studying at Johns Hopkins. There's one with Griffithson. They have ver- those. The act- when I say what Griffithson oh, I'm sorry, is, yeah, really so, so Griffithson. So the active is. ingredients are quite different. Tenofovir. Many people are familiar with it's the right. same. It's one of the active ingredients in the in in oral prep. Right. It's Griff, half of Truvada. It's basically. half of Truvada. It's the yeah. tenofovir part of whether it's the first or the second half, but right. it's an important part of that. Um, the Griffithson is a <clears throat> it's a much more complex molecule, but it's actually a natural product. And the way it would work is it would actually bind the virus. It would bind HIV in the rectum. So it would capture the HIV particles, the viral particles, before they ever get exposure to the mucosal surface. Now, these are all statistical events, but the idea is you get enough in there so that it's a very, very improbable that any viral particle will get all the way to the mucosal surface and then be at risk of infecting. And we've even talked a little bit about, I think we need to develop both of these sort of in parallel as sure. best we can. But boy, this might be a really nice combination of things, and we have no reason to believe they would not be compatible. Yeah. But that that work. So who's doing this us. work? Who's do, well, we Johns Hopkins is so doing Johns the Hopkins tenofovir is doing douche. the thing. Right. So that's a, there's a, there's a group of people I work with, on that. Um, Kenneth Palmer at the University of Louisville in Kentucky is leading the uh, I think Prevent is the name of his group, and that's also a pro. These are both program project grants that are funded by the NIH. Part of the um, it's a complicated acronym, but it's basically a program. Uh, that has focused on uh, microbicide development and early stage, early like stage, it exactly moving. So it takes, you know, it takes novel, risky ideas from the laboratory and moves them uh, forward through uh, in vitro laboratory testing into animal model testing. We we're studying ours, our our douche in macaques. It works. It works better than oral in macaques. Uh, I have to say, so there's higher drug levels in macaques higher, compared to no, humans. Get, so, so the macaques are the macaques are different in some in some ways, but the macaques have been used as really the gateway forward for essentially all of the topical products, or almost all the topical products. So, so having a product where we we put our our douche, which is sort of on demand. So, in the macaques, you know, they don't. You know they don't. They we, don't have to def- we have to define on demand, demand is your demand. Right. We, yeah. we we demand we demand <laughs> that they get the douche. Right. And then and then we simulate. And then we actually give them a exposure to a, to a monkey HIV basically mm-hmm. uh, to do that. Uh, and they were very well protected. I think five out of six of the monkeys were protected. We compared that in the same model, same hand, same same primate facility in um, in Louisiana, and. As it turns out, then we gave them um, oral daily prep, the the licensed product, but at a dose that makes sense for monkeys, mm-hmm. right. uh, for the macaques. calibrated, yeah. Cal- exactly, and and we and they about fifty percent of those were protected, and that was with the tenofovir m trisidabine, the Truvada, and and ours looked even better than that. So that was very reassuring that we looked we You're looked on good. the right path. We're we're yeah. in good company. Right? Sure, so, sure. 
So we got high levels of protection. Uh, so we were happy with that. So we've got the behavioral piece where we actually just finished a, a grinder survey. This was done by Alex Cabral Diegas at Columbia, who's part of our group, that was some of this data that I described before, where a large percentage of, of men that practice receptive anal, uh, have receptive anal sex. This is sounding very medical when I say it that way. You say bottom. Bottom. So, right. bo so, the bo so bottom, Pig you know, bottom, you could say that too. I don't think or I'm, not. I'm, I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna say pig bottom. I did, so okay, you don't fine. have to. You can do that, all right. <laughs> Am I sweating? Am I, so, <laughs> so anyway, so, so, and again, a number of surveys, and the grinder survey in pick was like, you know, I think it was 75, 80%, um, always or almost always use the douche. And then we asked them, um, would you be interested in using a rectal microbicide? Uh, in a douche. In a douche. Yeah. Uh, you know, for all the reasons, and, and the, 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 the percentages were just extraordinarily high. I was like, all these three categories were 95, 96, 97%. If you already douche, would you like a rectal microbicide douche? Yes. If you don't douche, would you like a rectal microbicide douche? 95 plus percent, yes. If you're a top, would you encourage your partner? Would you be fine with your partner douching? Boy, what like, a great idea. Yeah. So, so that part was very possible. We have the behavioral piece, it, it works in the monkeys, and, and we've done studies. Uh, we've now finished our phase one studies. We still have samples to analyze and data, statistics to do on the data. But we, if you compare it to, again, we'll compare it to oral daily prep, uh, Truvada, and not for amtricitabine, we are one or two, in some cases, three, three logs, so that would be a thousand times higher concentrations than steady state levels with the oral. So you're getting so we, way so higher way concentrations higher. And the remarkable thing is the oral, the nature of it is, is if you take the usual dose, it takes you about a week to get to steady state, to, to get to a protective levels. Uh, in the Ipergay regimen, you can get there much sooner because you're doing a double dose. Mm -hmm. uh, so compared to those two, we're again, we're 10 or 100 or 1,000 fold, we're higher. And we, and we get there in one to three hours. And it's where the action is. It, well, that's so, I mean, right, so, it's in the so rectum the, where the action, that's where HIV that's the infection advantage because the happens. Because other, the, other the, the other part of this that, that, we, that, that I didn't mention directly is that you know, they're systemic versus topical. So what we're trying to do is to get all the drug, or almost all the drug, just where the actual, the first infections of the CD4 cells will occur in the lower GI tract, in the rectum. Uh, and we've studied exactly where the distributions are for viral surrogates to understand where we need to have these high concentrations. So we have a product that, that delivers that. The piece that's missing now, there's, there's two things that still have to be done. Um, one is to see um, how, how does this perform in the field? So if, if I enroll some folks in a study, how will they be feel using this for six months? Mm -hmm. This is part of their sex life. And, and the way these things often go, it's important to compare it to some other um, opportunity, some other option, and that might be the Ipergay regimen. So we could, you know, you'd spend some months on one, and then you roll over to the other, vice versa. Yeah. And then you say, and compare. how did it go? Yeah. And uh, because that comparison is important. But what's been seen, and this is interesting, it comes back to this choice issue. There's a number of studies that have been done recently, and these were all presented not at this meeting, but at an earlier prevention meeting in Madrid at R4P, Research for Prevention. Right. And in that study, there was a number of studies where they, they asked women questions saying, you know, and, and these are experiential studies where they would, you know, they have- They actually were trying They products. were try using the products, and it would be a film, um, it, would, it, it would, could be a, an insert, it could be um, a ring, it could be a gel, and it's like, you know, so which of these do you like? And the fact is, you know, some women love this and they hate this. Other women love this and hate that. And, and what you see, which is perhaps not surprising when you think about, you know, it's not, you know, if you're treating a medical condition, it, that's one thing. And, and that's, that's challenging enough. But when you're intervening in a way that's so intimately related to sex, and it's prevention, and it's not a condition, And you're putting it right? in vaginally, it's right. gonna have an impact. I mean, there, because, I mean, women, I'm sure no two women enjoy sex in exactly the same way. Right. The products they're gonna be willing to use, that they wanna use, uh, it's not gonna be the same for any two women. And the contraceptive experience is, I think, very informative and relevant for some of, the, for some of those specific reasons. Um, and, and what's been found over time is that every time there's an additional contraceptive product that gets added to the mix, the it floats all boats. The overall level of contra successful contraception in the population preventing pregnancies 
goes up. So the more tools overall, the more unwanted pregnancies in the contraceptive realm. Right, that, so that, are, would, that are prevented, that right, are avoided. It would, yeah. it would, then, right. you know, it and, stands and, to reason that the more prevention tools, the different options will prevent overall so more that's, HIV because so people have choices. So that's the hope. And that's, that's yeah. why, you know, so we've, so we've talked about the, the douche and there's, and there's a, a lube. I mean, if we could medicate a lube, yeah. that's more of a challenge for, for other reasons. Right. There's also, so those would be considered behaviorally congruent. There, there's a, a fast dissolving insert. So this, that would probably achieve concentrations very quickly because there's examples of that on the vaginal you side. You kind of just pop that in. You just kind of pop it in. It's a small yeah. thing. It's not as big as a suppository. There's other study, studies looking at a suppository formulation. Uh, those aren't as far along, but those are also possibilities. Uh, so there's a range of things. I, I think the one thing that has been ruled out too largely for rectal microbicides is actually using the same kind of kind of longish plastic applicator that was used in the vaginal studies. I'm People not sure the women like, liked them so yeah, much. Yeah, the applicators but, but are the not men, cute. But the men no. did not like those. Right, no. And that's why I'm talking about other ways of getting the drug in. And so, so the suppository is still a possibility, a fast dissolving insert. The films that are used in women, it would be harder to deliver that. It's more complicated to get that. To get you, it in there. You've got to cover more distance, right? Yeah. It's much easier to apply that vaginally. Um, so those are just some examples yeah. for topical rectal, um, some of which are behaviorally congruent. And those are the ones that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm biased. I'm most excited by those, but I think those fit best into men's lives. Well, we want to fit men into and, lives. Men and women's lives. Right, that because women can use sex. it for anal sex, for yeah. sure. So, um, and that raises an interesting thing. That the, the, challenge, the challenges are more, in a way, for women, just because women that, ha that practice vaginal, that have anal and vaginal sex, it's more complicated. So there the issue is you'd have to have a product uh, optimally, that would either, if you could put it in the vagina, it would protect the rectum, or if you put it in the rectum, it protects the vagina. They transfer across. Exactly, it would go across. It's a very thin, uh, very thin uh, membrane, but um, but if you're a small molecule, it's actually a, a significant hurdle. But there are examples of vaginal rings that, if you put it in, the, so you put it in the vagina, obviously, and if you measure the concentration in rectal fluid, you you measure concentrations that look like they may be high enough to provide protection it's to the rectum. That's fascinating. So yeah. this is early on, and sure. it's vaginal development, but the idea is that it would also provide rectal protection. So again, there's more work for that, but that's a, but that's a possibility. That's not been in, into humans yet, uh, but that kind of technology is. it's being is, thought of, right. It's being thought of, and it's a way to be much more inclusive to cover all the ways that a woman might be at risk. Wouldn't that be a great idea? I love it. That? Um, because the, the current products looks like they, the, the vaginal ring, for example, is under review by the European Medicines Agency, right. doesn't achieve very high concentrations. The tenofovir gels don't achieve very high concentration. But there's other drugs that are, that are very well tolerated, used systemically, that look like they might well get there in adequate concentration. So there's more work. But that's the kind of thinking to, to be sure you sort of meet all the women's needs you meet um, the needs of any persons that have that have anal sex yeah. um, with some of these strategies, and then there are people that they really want an injection or an implant, sure. so that you don't have Again, to worry about it. Again, choices and options. It's just a matter of everybody has a different sensitivity and desire. And if, and if again, I think the float all boats sort of thing. If you've got more options, and and it increases the overall level of protection in a population, so that safe is. Safe is fun. Sex is fun and doesn't put one at increased risk. That's a laudable goal. And yeah. how we get there with this variety of choices, you know, we'll develop. I think I th my sense is that what everyone wants to do is develop the products that make the most sense, that have the data behind them. So we'll generate the data. Uh, the groups that are doing the research will look at the data and make the best decision, considering how you have to cover transgender women, transgender men. Cisgender. I mean, you go through the whole thing. Right. So, however it is that people love, we need to find a way that fits into their life, their their this point in their life, so that they have ways to to do it more safely. I love that. So, in that, for my last question, and we have a little bit of time, just a little, um, is so with the MTN going away essentially, but this research being able to hopefully be picked up by the PTN. What are you, how, what do you think about the future? Where, where do you think we're going? Do you think we're going to be able to generate the, the will and the uh, desire to continue mm -hmm. this research with the folks who need yeah. to be part of that? So the, NI, you know, the NIH makes clear what their desires are in terms of products. And I think they have a very clear 
um, sense of priority for prevention that it be uh, injectable uh, and speci even specifically that it include broadly neutralizing antibodies. Yeah, that's been very clear. It's in their 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 FOA, which is what they 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 published, so that scientists, academics, know what to put in their proposals uh, to go into to be studied. Sort of a guide. Yeah, it's a, it's a guide, and you know you have to be responsive to that. That's clearly mm -hmm. what they want to do, and and I think that actually has a lot of promise. Sure, they've invested uh, so much in that. Uh, it would be foolish not to continue because they, they just knock down the technical problems one at a time. In the same way, we've, had, we've struggled with some failures just like the broadly neutralizing antibodies and just like vaccines, we have struggled over many years to get topical microbicides right. But we have in the same way dealt with different problems but we've been dealing with those problems. Learn more about adherence, learn more about acceptability, learn more about fitting into into a point in a person's life, learning about choice and having these. So all of these could fit in. Um, my sense is the way that the NIH has asked people to think about putting together these networks is that they are open to making the case for, for two things. If there's a population at risk that can be defined, and that's not hard, there's lots of those, right. and they're all quite different, but if one can identify a, a population at risk where there's an, an unmet medical need for prevention. And they talk about compelling public health. Compel, com, compelling need, public right? health. And, yeah. and we've talked about some of these where even if the numbers are small, the, and, and I've, you know, we've mentioned transgender women a lot, the, risk, the rates of HIV infection are, uh, are, are, are very, very high. Young black MSM, especially in cities, but also in rural areas. I mean, the president's new initiative to, to reach into those areas. Um, and some of these products we're dealing with, both the injectables but also the topicals, are trying to address some of those specific needs. Because when, when I talk with groups that are in the community, young black MSM, they're telling me, you know, they don't want drug levels all the time. Right. They want to have something that fits into their, into their life and is behaviorally congruent. I mean, they, they don't state it in exactly those terms. But those are the sort of things that get them excited. But you hear, there's a, again, there's a variety of needs. So I think that, that uh, what we're looking at is, is we have clearly defined populations at risk. And the NIH is clear about what some of those are. Yeah. And I think it's open to continue to define what those groups are. I think women that don't practice anal sex is a compelling group. That's a huge group, especially sure. in, in low and middle income countries where the rates are very high and the women, um, you know, there's power, there's all kinds of reasons for that. That's, we don't need to get into that. But, but that's, a, that's a population where we have a number of products that look very exciting. An on-demand vaginal film that may provide protection for weeks. Wow. That's very promising. Yeah. Um, but that's a, that's a compelling, that's a, a compelling medical, unmet medical need in that, in, that, um, in that population. And then you have to line up the evidence. And the NIH is all about lining, looking at the evidence to make decisions where there's unmet needs and um, regardless of markets, which is what that's, the NIH has the freedom to do that to some degree. Right. Uh, but then line that up with the best data. So, that's right. So we've just, we've got to present the best data we've got and, and hope that the group of people will look at that and go forward with things that are promising. And it's, it's very clear that BNABs are going to be on that list. The crit criterion as they're established are actually a little bit different for those. So I think that's, those will go forward. Sure. And yeah. that's exciting. On the other hand, we're, we have to identify the populations, we have to identify, we have to put the data together, some of which we've talked about here, um, and make our best argument. I am convinced that, that the NIH is open to that. I think the, the um, future network leadership is open as well. We just have to make the case and, and keep working hard at this thing and just keep, you know, keep the data coming, um, keep in touch to understand what the unmet needs are, and and do our best science to meet the needs of people where they are. That is a beautiful way to end this conversation. Okay. So thank you, Craig. We have a lot of work to do. We you do. have a lot of work yeah. to do as a scientist. I have a lot of work to do as a rabble rouser. So let's get back to it. Okay. And thank you, sir. All right, Jim. Thanks. It's always good. Thank you.